live on Facebook. So I'm going to go ahead and get this ball rolling. Sounds good, bud. So let me make sure. Okay, so everybody, um, all of our participants connected in through Zoom, I've got you all muted. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask uh, Clarence, go ahead and you can type them in the chat um, or possibly at the end of uh, Clarence's program. Um, I might be able to have you on mute to ask questions live. Um, if you are tuned in and watching from Facebook, I will try to monitor comments on Facebook. And if you post any questions to Facebook, I will uh, endeavor to get those asked as well. Um, but if I miss them, I apologize in advance. I'll be working two screens here. So I'm going to start out with a quick introduction here. Uh, first off, my name is Leighton Shell, Director of the Stickney 4 c Public Library District. Thank you for joining us for this exciting program we have tonight on Zoom. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't have it in person here at the library. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that again uh, very soon. Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you Clarence Goodman, our guest tonight. Clarence Goodman is a self-styled entertainer and historian whose actual and literal travels have taken him all over the map and all over the place. His love for his hometown and eventual return to it have proven to be a blessing as his efforts have made him a favorite of libraries, historical societies, radio, television, and film. And he joins us today with one, with one of his more than 30 Chicago-centric topics. Um, and I think I just heard someone else chime in, so I'm going to make sure they're muted. But I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you, Mr. Goodman. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Leighton. Good evening, Leighton. And a big shout of appreciation to Leighton and everyone else with the Stickney Forest View Public Library. And good evening to all of you, and thank you for joining us in Zoom land, as well as Facebook land, and whatever whatever other kind of land there is out there. And welcome to Public Enemy Dillinger in Chicago, another chapter of Murder Chicago style. All of the images that I'm using tonight, my friends, I do so within the fair use parameters of the American copyright laws. I am Clarence Goodman, your host for our little clam bake this evening, and let's get right to it. Why? Why? Why do we care about John Dillinger? Let me tell you something, everybody. This cat was only nationally famous for about a year, and here we are going on 90 years since he left this earth, and we still care. Presumably, none of us out there right now were alive at the time, and some of our parents weren't even alive at the time. None of my parents, neither of my parents were alive at the time, and all of my grandparents were very, very young. Why do we care? Why do we care so much that there have been not one, not two, not three, but four movie depictions of John Dillinger, and we basically only had um, a Hollywood and the permutations of Hollywood, Bollywood, and when Chicago was the first version of Hollywood, we've only had this going for about 110 years. So we get a new picture about Dillinger on the average about once every 30 years. Why? Why? There are more movies about John Dillinger than there are are any singular movies about singular US presidents. There are movies about incidents, but there aren't four or five pictures strictly about FDR, or Jack Kennedy, oh, Abraham Lincoln, whatever, here we go. For every story, there is a backstory. So let's look a little bit at our backstory. First of all, when we're getting into the era just before Dillinger, we're talking about the roaring 20s, and oh yes, of course, the defining quality of the Roaring Twenties, of course, here in America, Prohibition, which of course led to the ultimate uh, guy on the make, if you want to know about that. And of course, that is Al Capone here in Chicago. And of course, ah, the jazz era, Art Deco, flappers, oh, all kinds of wonderful music. Jazz music was very, very young and it was exploding all over the joint. And then of course, a baseball becomes the most popular sport in America in the 1920s typified by the jazz era baseball team. That would be the murderer's row Yankees of the 1920s, featuring, of course, Messrs. Gehrig and Ruth from left to right, respectively. And then, of course, a new era of art. Imagine an organ playing, the silent film era. Everybody was crazy about the pictures. And early in the silent film era, none other than Chicago, USA was the capital 
of America's film industry. And then, of course, our very, very interesting triumvirate of presidents in the 1920s. Warren G. Harding, who would just look at that face and look at those eyebrows. He was an interesting cat. He dies in office. He, of course, was nominated in 1920. Then his successor, because of death, is Calvin Coolidge, the man known as Silent Cal, because he only wanted to do one term, and then he wanted out. The guy rarely talked. He was the, if you will, the, the Marcel Marceau of pre United States presidents. And then, as if to get the flip side of the presidency, we get Herbert Hoover, who, who was not only verbose, but he was uh, cocksure. Not so much cockstrong, but cocksure. This triumvirate of presidents in many ways defines the 1920s, and then bam, bam, bam. Oh, my goodness. Look at the egg that Wall Street lays in the lap of President Hoover. Yes, the, the crash of the stock market, which of course leads to the Great Depression and Dust Bowls and this confluence of every crappy thing happening in the Western world. Unprecedented and we've never had anything since really with regard to Western economy. And this of course leads to runs on banks and failures of banks all over the place and failures of farms and auctioning of farms and my goodness gracious, at one point, one in nearly every three Americans was out of work and so many Americans, so many of our compatriots lining up for free coffee, free donuts. My goodness gracious, why can't you give my dad a job, brother? Can you spare a dime? Indeed. And this, of course, gives, li gives rise to to one of the most opportunistic groups of people in the history of the United States. And that, of course, is the early 20th century bank robber. And these guys, let it be known, this was a really, really finite period that these people enthralled, terrorized, and captivated the heartland of the United States. And this, of course, included Bonnie and Clyde, that, of course, is Bonnie on the left, and Clyde Barrow on the right, the Ma Barker game charming picture. This would be a uh, baby, excuse me, this would be uh, Machine Gun Kelly. This would be Pretty Boy Floyd, the outlaw, as Woody Guthrie sang so eloquently. Babyface Nelson, Chicago's own Babyface Nelson, which of course leads us to the center of our narrative tonight, one John Herbert Dillinger Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this picture. This picture is nearly a century old, but it is screaming with as much charisma as the day it was taken. And again, I ask, why? What's the fascination? Let's get right into it. Johnny Dillinger was born in Indiana in 1903, and he was, look at those cheeks, didn't change in 31 years. He was incredibly close to his mother, who died at a very early age. And then this made Johnny a very, very sullen young man and something of a loner and something of a troubled kid. And he was not encouraged by his father to pursue anything with regard to his brains and his ability. And that's a shame because this guy had charisma, this guy had guts, this guy had bravado, and this guy had way more intelligence than anybody around him gave himself credit for. He really didn't have a chance. He also didn't have a chance. Well, I have a theory about men who are juniors. A lot of us who are born juniors um, and our dads are a particular way, it kind of messes us up. And this is a picture, one of the few pictures of both the John Dillingers, senior on the left, of course, and junior on the right. They had a troubled relationship, one of respect, but one of violence, and one that typified relationships back in the early part of the last century, which is uh, guys are tough. Dads don't hug their sons and all of these things that we know, Dr. Spock, are you listening, that we shouldn't have been doing. And to top it all off, John Dillinger Sr. took up with an, another woman and got remarried fairly early in John's life. And this is, a, this, this is an incredibly defining uh, event here. Not only did uh, John Sr. replace John Jr.'s beloved mother fairly quick, which was actually pretty common back in the day, but there is more 
than just a slight preponderance of certainty that Junior got involved sexually, that is, in an inappropriate relationship with his stepmother. Now, um, any one of us who's ever gotten involved with an inappropriate sexual relationship, it kind of marks us for a bit. But when we are mm, deluded and polluted and corrupted and tainted early on before we even really understand romance and sex and love and things like that, it kind of screws us up forever without tremendous therapy, the likes of which did not exist in the 1920s and the teens, which is when this happened with uh, Johnny. And then it, many sociologists and the like, smarter women and men than I say that a person like this oftentimes in one way or another can become a sex addict. Nevertheless, this picture of John from high school looks like he has a little more swagger than he had earlier on. Maybe um, he was deriving his swag from the fact that he was having sex with a grown woman. Who knows, contrary to popular belief, I was not alive then. But Johnny is going through school as kind of a near do well. The one thing um, with regard to academics that he uh, succeeds at and really, really excels at, wood shop and machine shop. Everything else he pretty much blows off except for being the class clown. And I can imagine this, I'm sure you can too. Somebody that charismatic, but with no discernible skills and talents when it comes to the three R's reading and writing and arithmetic was probably an absolute riot and spent a whole lot of time in the Dean's office, undoubtedly. He is a very, very good athlete, which we'll find out a little bit more later. But the one, a couple of things that Johnny, when he enters his teens, it's clear that he is going to be prolific at. And that is his love of women slash sex, his love of booze slash specifically whiskey. This guy was a whiskey and bourbon drinker, much like I used to be when I was young. And he loved baseball. So the triumvirate of John Dillinger's loves to be joined by a fourth down the line, that would be sex, booze, and baseball. Sounds like an all-American guy in the early part of the 20th century. And with regard to John, John was a good baseball player. Moreover, moreover, he was a shortstop. And for those of you who know and love baseball like I do, and you know the positions, there is something majestic, something magnificent, something romantic, and something absolutely inspiring about a shortstop. The cornerstone, as they are known. Most shortstops are athletic. Most You have to be fearless to be a shortstop or a second baseman in uh, softball or uh, baseball, obviously, for that matter. And this is going to come into play with regard to the career that John chooses, or rather Johnny chooses down the line. With no discernible skills, with no discernible prospects, with no discernible nothing except that swag, he joins the Navy. Look at him there on the left, looking just like a sailor boy. Doesn't he Cracker Jack? What do you get in Cracker Jack? But he doesn't like Reverly. He doesn't like getting up early and he doesn't like taking orders from people. And so he goes AWOL pretty early on. Um, this, is, this is indicative of his penchant to buck the fences and buck the walls and buck the chains that are going to be around him the rest of his life. And what does he do on the rebound? He gets married. You go a wall, you find a young bride and you get uh, married. This is a wedding picture of John and his first wife or his only wife, I beg your pardon, Bethel Hobbius or Hobius. I'm not sure how that is pronounced. I've never heard either that that first name nor that surname in my life, but nevertheless, they did get married and then they got a quickie divorce as well. So, my goodness, a failed marriage, no job, no prospects, no opportunities, no school and no education, no nothing. So Johnny decides to get into crime and he's gonna start small, oh so small, he is going to hold up the local general store, which is not gonna have a whole lot of money he does this and he gets caught and here's the problem and this is one of the defining moments uh when it comes to john's career and life for the rest of his 20 odd years excuse me um 15 odd year 14 odd years that he's got left on this planet the general store that he robs happens to also be 
the post office. And so holding up or threatening or do anything, doing anything against a postal or a federal employee, a postal or a federal outlet or so forth, is a federal offense. And so in spite of the fact that he has a clean record and in spite of the fact that everybody who knows him goes down to the courtroom and vouches for him and, and absolutely testifies that he's not a bad kid and after all, he's just a kid, the judge throws the book at him and sentences him to get this. He is sentenced for nine years in a boys school or a boys home or reformatory, something like that. So not the big house because he is just a kid, but this is an incredibly long sentence for, I believe he stole maybe $20, which is obviously less than chump change today. A lot of money back in the early part of the 20th century, but certainly not enough to get you thrown in the hooskow for the better part of a decade. So Johnny is there in the reformatory and he doesn't like these chains, he doesn't like these walls, doesn't like these fences, does not like captivity. And so he and a bunch of other cats escape. Oh my goodness gracious. And they're caught in nothing flat because they have no game, they have no plan. And so this time when John is caught, oh, let me back that up a little bit. Oh, never mind. We'll, we'll can proceed forward here. This time when they capture John, and they uh, put him back on, on, uh, under lockup. This time they send him to a maximum security male penitentiary, the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City, Indiana. In other words, the big house where he is there with hardened criminals. And there now there has been evidence revealed that it is during this period that John Dillinger, like so many other hardened criminals, who becomes incarcerated very early and who has what the tendencies of what we would now refer to um, and categorize as sexual addiction, he gets sex in prison, which means that the, the two-fisted uh, swaggering ladies man that John, the way John Dillinger has been portrayed in the films, Obviously, all bets are off when he's in prison because there's only one way to get your sex in prison. So further evidence that John Dillinger is a sex addict and it might be um, a medium of exchange in prison. I don't know. I've never been there. Knock, knock wood. So he's in the big house and he's got all these older hardened criminals around him and he starts hanging out with a bunch of guys who are all there for bank robbery. The first one is a guy who's going to become his lifelong friend, Harry Pete Pierpont. Another guy's a name with the name of Charlie Mackey. And then we have Homer Van Meter. All of these guys are there. Not only are they there for uh, bank robbery, but they are there because they are students of the Herman K. Lamb uh, method of robbing banks. Believe it or not, this guy, Herman K. Lamb, taking it on the lamb, was to, he brought to the crazy, crazy debauchery and unorchestrated and unchoreographed nonsense that bank robberies often were. He brought to that a scientific approach, a methodology that would be deliberate and meticulous and sometimes rather in the past most people who rob banks would go into a bank and just start blasting up the place if anybody said anything and they had no idea what they were getting into they might get a huge take they might get a minuscule take herman k lamb brought the whole idea of case in a bank seeing not only when the best time to hit the bank would be but also when the greatest number of deposits had been made and when the transference of the uh, money occurred. And ideally, you wanted to hit the place when it was softest with regard to guards and when it was its heaviest with regard to deposits. So all of these guys schooled Johnny and Johnny was a good pupil. And then dun, 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 nine years, nine years after he had been sent up the river, he is paroled. So at this point, Johnny Dillinger is 30 years old and he has been incarcerated for a third of his life. He's actually just short of 30 years old when he is paroled. 
wow, this is great. And boy, the problem is 1933 America is a whole lot different than 1924 America. 1924, jazz, flappers, prohibition, I'm in the money, and all this other stuff has been replaced by, brother, can you spare a dime? President Roosevelt has just gotten into office. I mean, he's literally just gotten into office when Johnny is paroled because Inauguration Day back in those days was Chicago's birthday, March 4th, 1933. So Chicago celebrates 100 years and there's a new president and John Dillinger is out on the street. Wow, what a confluence of circumstances and events right there. And so Johnny is ready to start this new profession. He went into prison as a green thumb, green ear, tin horn, who was inexperienced, young, and a novice. He hasn't done any serious robbing of banks, but he is ready to come out and make his mark. And he's hoping for a long and winding career of uh, making money the old fashioned way, stealing it from people. And so with this in mind, he and this band of renowns that he gets together with on June 21st, 1933, just before he turns 30, John Dillinger robs his first bank in Indiana, the first national bank in New Carlisle, Indiana, and the vast majority of banks that John would hit and case and so forth are going to be in his home state of Indiana. And the periphery the peripheral states and the contiguous states around Illinois. And naturally enough, he's not had any practice in nine years. And so he gets pitched. Oh, my goodness gracious. So he's back in the who scout. However, much of his gang is still out and they are going to break him out because John very quickly, though he is considerably younger than these cats, he clearly is the leader. And so like a basketball star, like, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or George Mikan throwing a sky hook in. Do John's compatriots throw a bunch of materials and tools and so forth into in over the wall of the jail in order to aid and abet him in his escape? And so he escapes. Locked up, he gets out. And this time, what they do, there's a reason I have that image. One of the first places they hit this time, rather than getting back on the fast track for um robbing banks, they rob a sheriff's department. Looking just like Barney and Andy there, why would you rob a sheriff's department? Because it, you can avail yourself to all kinds of juicy, splendid, potent weapons that most criminals don't have and a whole lot of law enforcement agencies in these small towns that they're going to hit, a lot of them don't have as well. So you've got this firepower advantage. And if you are doing nothing but doing kind of a beach beachhead operation, popping around, island hopping to these small towns, you're going to be busy, but you might be pretty productive too and not get clobbered too much with regard to the heat that's um, in place there. And so loaded up, unlocked, loose. The first national bank in East Chicago, Indiana is a landmark hit for Johnny because this is the first hit that they do once Johnny is out again. And this is the only time the records show that somebody died as a result of a bullet from one of the Dillinger gang's pistols or rifles. The people who were there, the, the, the or I shouldn't say the people who were there, because the people who were there were largely on the ground. However, when the law showed up, one of them got hit. And of course, the, the, the uh, responding agents and officers and so forth pointed the finger at John Dillinger. So John Dillinger has got instant fame. He's been fingered for this death, an accidental death. We'll never know if he did it. My guess is that he didn't. It's not his style to kill people. And so you're, you're going to hit all of these banks in the periphery and the contiguous states and areas around northeastern Illinois. Why? Because you want to live and play and spend that money in the fastest rising city in the world at that point. 1933 Chicago, the population in 100 years had grown from 400 to about three and a half million people. Moreover, our second world's fair had just opened up. 
What a wonderful place to spend money. What a wonderful place to get a drink. And what a wonderful place um, to find professional women that were um, willing to tutor him in uh, certain things that he was interested in. After all, the Levy District was a very short walk, if you will, or and certainly a short drive away from where the world's fa- where, where the World's Fair campus was. And that, of course, was the museum campus, the Levy District, about a half mile due west of um, the museum campus. And so what Johnny does is he wants to get to the World's Fair all the time. And so he stays at this hotel, the Hotel Krillin, which was at Michigan Avenue, Michigan Boulevard, as it was known then, and 13th Street. So I want you to imagine this hotel at the corner of Michigan Avenue and Roosevelt Road, right by the park. You walk across the park and you are at the World's Fair. Heaven, 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 heaven. And speaking of heaven, John Dillinger meets the woman that will become the love of his life, more or less, and certainly the woman with whom he is uh, symbiotically linked forever to this day, and that is a young waitress by the and slash um, working girl <clears throat> by the name of... Uh, Billy Fouchette. They meet at a small restaurant in Indiana um, and a party, and uh, she decides to make a, uh, a change in her employment. She goes from being a working girl and waitress to being <clears throat> a gun mall with John Dillinger, having no idea that she was going to become famous, nor any idea that Dillinger was going to become famous. All she knew that it was a good time and the Great Depression was still going on. And I can imagine how many working class people and how many rural people who had been struggling for four or five years just wanted to have some fun. And so what do they do? They see Chicago. Here is a picture of them at the World's Fair. And this is one, one, one of the wonderful things about Dillinger, adding to his legend and adding to his charisma, What he loved to do was hide in plain sight, even after he had become nationwide with his fame and his infamy, actually. He loved hiding in plain sight. He did not really go down underground unless the heat was getting particularly hot. So what he liked to do was just be right out of there at the World's Fair, in in spite of the fact that he might have mud on his shoes, although he changed them for his spectators here. He might have mud on his shoes and mud on his tires from the back rows that they just uh, took from the last bank they heist, they held up back to Chicago, head right to the World's Fair, head all over Chicago, and have fun with all of this cash. Never thinking that somebody flashing this kind of a wad of cash would have to be a recipient of um, somewhat uh, dubious funds and things like this. And this particular picture, the legend about this is Dillinger handed his camera to a cop who was on duty at the World's Fair and asked the cop to take it. You gotta love that kind of stuff. So they're living all over the north side of Chicago when Dillinger has enough um, wisdom at this point to know that staying in one place for uh, an extended amount of time is probably a bad idea. So they, this is him and uh, Pipot and all of these other cats Uh, Pierpont and all of these other cats, they bounce around with their girlfriends. This building is still there at 1101 North Clark Street. Here he lives, and this is um, where he was living, or this is a place that they moved into after he took up with uh, Billy Frechette. Also, 901 West Addison, a block away from Wrigley Field. Billy lived in this apartment building when she met him, and so he spent a lot of time uh, there. And then up a little further, um, just a little bit east of uh, the uh, Graceland Cemetery there, we have 4310 Clarendon, where um, Billy and Johnny lived for a couple of weeks. And so this was the practice. A place would get too hot too easily. Excuse me, I gotta have a sip of water. Thank you. Popping all over the place, and then when they had made a particularly big score, ho, 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 let's have some fun. Not only would they go back downtown, but they would stay for a couple of three or four nights at the Hotel Sherman and College Inn. This was the swankiest hotel in downtown Chicago. This was the swankiest hotel, I should say, in the loop. 
in many ways, in many respects, this was swankier than uh, the Palmer House or any of the hotels on Michigan Avenue. This hotel was at the site where the Jim Thompson Center is today. This was a wildly popular place. This place was so popular, it is mentioned in the song, Chicago, that toddling town in the middle eight that nobody ever plays, except I think me. I'm the only one who plays that part of it. But anyway, when they had the extra money, they'd have extra fun. And then taking in the Rainbow City, as it was called, Chicago's Second World's Fair, while this was going on in Chicago, we had the final, the, the, the final battles, if you will, of the war between the North Siders and the South Siders. And of course, this war started with um, Johnny Torrio versus Dean O'Banion and then came into its own when Capone took over the South Side and Capone uh, murdered his way through the South Side. And then once he went away to jail for good, his successor was this man, Frank the Enforcer Nitty. Frank the Enforcer Nitty, as Capone's uh, enforcement man, already had a reputation. So when he took over the rackets, and in many ways, he was shrewder than Capone because he wasn't a hothead uh, like Capone, and he wasn't addicted to cocaine and women like Al Capone was. Frank Nitty was putting the finishing touches on the war with the North Siders, taking out this gentleman here, Roger Terrible Tui of the North Side. While all of this was going on, Johnny knew to keep his distance respectfully and make sure that he was never going to infringe upon anybody's territory because the last thing you want to do is tick off one of these dudes during the beer wars of the 1920s and into the 1930s. And now that prohibition had been re repealed, it was clear that this war was going to be over from a bootlegging capacity, but there were still a few scores to be settled which uh, leads us to this man, the mayor of Chicago. The final score that was settled when it came to the beer wars of the Roaring Twenties and into the Thirties was the assassination of the mayor of Chicago, Tony Cermak. So with him being killed February 13th, 1933, the town was a was being run by Nitty now and all of the descendants of the Capone organization even though Capone was in jail he still had a hand so um Johnny like everybody is very happy to watch from a box seat eat his popcorn and not get hit by stray bullets so Johnny has been in jail for so long he has developed um a, an itch he has developed um a sickness it was called um Barber's itch Barber's itch and trap was um, a social disease that was fairly typical back 100 years ago. And it was really, really um, common where a lot of people, men, were in close quarters with one another, um, like jails and like um, mm, the military and so forth. However, the, the medical attention you get in the military is far superior to that that you, that you get in prison. So what Barber's Itch and Trap is, is a, a ring -like, ringworm-like outbreak in the shaving area due to excessive and close shaving. That is the textbook di di uh, definition, but there's some speculation that it also has to do with the social proximity um, that people have with one another. I'll let you fill in the blanks there. So, John goes to Dr. Charles I on the north side for treatment. And he and Billy go to this clinic up on the north side to get treatment. And John suspects that there is a trap. And so while he's receiving this treatment, sure enough, a sixth sense, his spider senses must have been tingling. Rather than go down the front door, he and Billy haul backside out the back door and head down the back stairs. And they jump in their car and they start to back out top speed out of this alley behind the uh, doctor's office. And sure enough, there had been a trap set for them by the Chicago Police Department. So when the cops realize that Dillinger is getting away, what follows, what ensues is a high speed chase around the north side of Chicago. And you know how this story ends. Dillinger gets away and the Chicago Police Department look stupid, 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 stupid. So, so much heat is on John at this point. They decide they've been pretty productive at this point. We're in getting into uh, 
November and December of 1933, and John has not missed Midwest winter, so they decide to go to Florida for the winter of the early part of 1934. And so off they go to Florida to enjoy the sun, enjoy the beaches, and not rob any banks. And they get bored very quickly. Florida of the 1930s is a lot different than the Florida of today. And so they say, you know, there's no action here. There's no nothing here. So they hightail it to Arizona. Obviously, another warm climate, but this one promised you to have more fun, just given the proximity to Mexico and so forth and all of the fun that they have. And so John decides to hide in plain sight. He and his uh, gangmates hide in plain sight in Arizona, and they get pinched. They get absolutely pinched, and Johnny is under lock and key, and he is extradited back to Indiana to the Crown Point Jail. He is going to be, he's going to uh, be sent up, sent back to jail because obviously he has committed a number of bank uh, robberies at this point and he already has this record, which of course the parole is revoked and all of that. So John Dillinger looks like he's in a hell of a fix. And he has a lawyer by the name of Louis Piquette. That is him on the right. Um, to use the word flamboyant, to describe Mr. Paquette is an understatement. Um, there are a number of legendary lawyers who were known in, in our nation's history who were known more for their um, hmm, bravado and more for their style and more for their oratory embellishments rather than their actual legal know-how. Louis Paquette, Paquette is one of them. However, Dude had some smarts, and so he meets with his client, John Dillinger, and they have one meeting, and Johnny is very, very confident that everything's going to go great. How else can you explain him posing like old lodge buddies with all of the people who have him incarcerated? I can't imagine someone that's getting ready to get sent to the big house would be buddying up with somebody like that today, and so... He is put back in jail while he's going, he is awaiting his transfer to the big house and everything, and everything's going to be uh, locked down and everything. And then, of course, he produces this. How did he get this? The, the original speculation and the legend of John Dillinger was that he had the tools and the wherewithal and the raw material to carve this little replica gun. We don't know if that's true or not. There is also speculation that this was the one thing that his attorney, Louis Paquette, Esquire, did for him, was slipped him this little replica of a handgun, and Johnny busted his way out. He hooked up with his gang again, and it was back to the prolific life that they had led hitherto to this point. So the list of confirmed banks that John Dillinger robbed most of them are in Indiana and then Ohio, as you can plainly see. Wisconsin, Iowa, they go as far west as Iowa, but mostly it's just over the border in Indiana and just over the next border into Ohio. Incredibly prolific was he. And there are so many small towns in Indiana that know for sure that John Dillinger not only robbed a bank there, but stayed there and either did something. A lot, there was a big, big industry um, pertaining to John Dillinger in many towns of Indiana, most notably Hammond. And of course, what you gonna do? Gonna go back to Chicago now. Gonna go back to all the fun and go back to my sweet Billy. And indeed, oh, there she is. Indeed, they get together. Oh, and I think, I'm sorry, I think this was probably a book from her funeral. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I just thought it was a cute picture, but I just noticed that. Anyway, Billy and John hook back up and they're having all kinds of fun, spending all kinds of money. John is going out and stealing it, but new characters in our story. The Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but in its early uh, years, the newly formed Bureau of Investigation is now, even though it claims that it was never our intention to be a national police force, it sure as heck is a national police force, especially when it was run by this man, J. 
Edgar Hoover, who ran this not so much like a national police department, but he really ran it in many ways like the Gestapo, which happened to be rearing their heads across the pond a little bit at this point. J. Edgar Hoover didn't like stuff going on on his watch. And in spite of the fact that he denied the existence of organized crime until the 1960s, he was, he was a bureaucrat and he really enjoyed the prestige that this gig gave him. So any organization or any person or any gang that was making him look bad and he wasn't getting a little taste of it, that is where he had a problem. And this whole thing about these people robbing banks all over the United States was ridiculous. Now, he hires a gentleman by the name of Melvin Purvis, never nervous Purvis. Melvin Purvis is an agent who is going to be the specific point man about getting Dillinger. He's going to answer questions about Dillinger. He's going to come up with the strategy. He's going to hire the task force. And then ultimately, he is going to get John Dillinger. Never Nervous Purvis. Never Nervous Purvis in the movie says was played by Hollywood tough guy, Ben Johnson. A great job in the film Dillinger with the late great Warren Beatty. Batman himself, nobody's tougher than Batman, Christian Bale playing Never Nervous Purvis in Public Enemies with John Depp. But the truth of the matter about Never Nervous Purvis was he was even more of an effete bureaucrat, if you will, than Hoover was. And he was not cut out for this job. He wasn't particularly clever. He wasn't particularly uh, tough. And he it really seemed like he had not spent a lot of time doing policeman's or, and by this point, policewoman's work, which is getting stuff under your fingernails and this kind of stuff. In fact, from the very beginning of his tenure as uh, the never nervous purpose and his band of renowns out to get John Dillinger, Hoover never has anything good to say about the guy. He's lucky that he didn't get um, a performance review from his job because it would have stunk up the joint. In fact, one time while the, the, the situation with the bank robbers, specifically uh, John Dillinger, is really, really, really getting hairy and dear, Hoover is approached for a quote by the press about Never Nervous Purvis. And the only nice thing that Hoover can say about Never Nervous Purvis is, well, he sure dresses nice. Nice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're supposed to be a hardened lawman or law woman, and your immediate supervisor can only say, yeah, they dress nice, you got a problem and you really need to get your resume together. So Never Nervous Purvis has got one foot on a banana peel and one foot in the unemployment line. Meanwhile, John Dillinger, when he gets back to Chicago, he finds that most of his band, most of his gang are now working for this Chicago grown uh, bank robber whose name is Babyface Nelson. And unlike the um, poetic license that film have taken with the relationship between Johnny Dillinger and Babyface Nelson, uh, John Dillinger came in and was very, very deferential to Babyface Nelson. John Dillinger came in and said, all right, this is your gang. We'll see how it goes. No problem. I'm just looking for a gig. That doesn't make nearly as juicy a story as um, Richard Dreyfus and uh, Warren Oates getting into a fist fight in a movie that features Cloris Leachman and Ben Johnson. A, a great picture. If you want to see the best Dillinger picture, it's Dillinger with Warren Oates from like 1973 or something like that. But nevertheless, Johnny's got a gig. And so when Johnny is not doing jobs on his own and doing jobs with Babyface Nelson, they are spending so much time at the World's Fair once again. And the legend about Dillinger is they took $800 cash and bought an eight-cylinder eight cylinder car on the, from the showroom of the World's Fair. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Eight-cylinder automobiles were very uncommon in the early 1930s. And let me tell you something. When you combine eight cylinders with an automatic Thompson submachine gun, that is an extremely, extremely lethal and productive weapon. Might as well be a tank. Also, spending time around Chicago, people out there my age and older, you remember Riverview. Riverview was coming into its own on the north side of Chicago and they ate up this fun. And then John Dillinger 
is lured into a trap. But of course, with the spidey senses tingling, he realizes, he senses that it's a trap. It's in the downtown area that is now known as the, excuse me, the Federal District. This is the Bankers Building, the Bankers Building at the junction of Adams and uh, Clark. A beautiful, beautiful old setback building from the first school. At this uh, particular uh, period, so this is 90 years ago, it housed many um, bureaus of the Chicago Police Department. And also there were some FBI um, offices there as well. There are federal offices all over the federal plaza, always have been, thus the name. Um, Specifically, the Get Dillinger squads of both of the, the Chicago Police Department and the FBI were headquartered in this building. John Dillinger was lured into a trap, He's supposed to go meet somebody or something. And so he and Billy drive up there and he sends Billy in as his emissary to see what's going on, not realizing that it's a police department. And then boom, 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 the trap is sprung. Billy is arrested, Billy is incarcerated, and John Dillinger speeds off. He will never see Billy again. Billy is incarcerated for quite a while there. Um, so John Dillinger scoops up his gang, they regroup, and they decide to take it on the lam <laughs> a little bit, and they head up to the Little Bohemia Resort in Wisconsin. And they're just gonna cool their heels there as summertime approach, approaches in Chicago as they plan their next strategy. Hoover and Never Nervous Purvis get all kinds of tips that Dillinger and his gang are hiding up there. And so Never Nervous Purvis must have been nervous this particular time for this particular raid because he and his boys, he and his G-men go to make this arrest and they completely botch everything. Everybody gets away, the whole joint gets shot up, and the Bureau of Investigation looks really, really stupid. J. Edgar Hoover was not on the scene, he's hanging out um, at gambling um, resorts that were not owned by organized crime. No, organized crime has never been involved with gambling resorts, specifically the gambling resorts that J. Edgar Hoover and his companion and second in command, uh, Clyde uh, Tosin used to frequent all the time. There's a joke there. Um, he hears about Never Nervous Purvis's latest mess up and he ages overnight and he wants to fire Never Nervous Purvis, but he's afraid that it's going to make Dillinger and by association, all of the other bank robbers that Hoover just assumes, and he's right, are a bunch of people who don't, who didn't go to college, people who didn't graduate high school, people who were just rural folks who were trying to make money the easy way, and they're making him look like a monkey. Oh, Hoover don't like this. So he turns up the heat a bit. He and Never, Never Nervous Purvis turn up the heat on John Dillinger. And so as we get into the summer of 1934, John Dillinger is starting to feel the heat. And he says, OK, I have a pretty distinctive face and my picture is all over the place. And I love seeing my picture all over the place. And my face is in newsreels all over the place. And I love seeing my face in newsreels. But maybe I better be a little more prudent. So he goes in for plastic surgery. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can all agree that John Dillinger, maybe it's because we've seen his face for going on 100 years, has a really, really, really distinctive face and a really, really distinctive hairline, haircut, and everything. And the mustache makes him look even more dashing than he already did, but the, he, truly the source of his looks is the swagger that he's got. So there's only so much that a plastic surgeon working on the down low is going to be able to do. Nevertheless, he heads to the north side to the offices of Dr. William Lesser. And William Lesser, Dr. Lesser's name is uh, pretty appropriate at this point because Dr. William Lesser couldn't have been less effective uh, when it came to changing Johnny's looks. He didn't want anything drastic, obviously, but he wanted to look different. He didn't look any different. He's John Dillinger, for goodness sake. You can, in the last few pictures you see up in life, you can maybe see a little difference, but not a whole bunch. And so John Dillinger turns 31, and he can celebrate that by hearing that he is now 
public enemy number one. The Attorney General of the United States has authorized a whole bunch of money for the arrest and capture and information for John Herbert Dillinger Jr. Happy birthday, John. And so, what it in five states? Don, John Dillinger, though, still hiding in plain sight. You would think that somebody would catch this guy, but maybe he has way more allies than the police and Hoover and Never Nervous Purvis and everybody realized because he was kind of a folk hero. So John Dillinger goes back to the north side of Chicago and he loves him some baseball and he spends every afternoon he can at Wrigley Field and every evening that he can at the movies. Remember, he missed the whole first decade of motion pictures in the American experience. Well, there's another business right down the street from Wrigley Field, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is a brothel. And it is at this brothel on Sheffield Avenue where he meets this woman. Her name is Polly Hamilton. And she is a working girl and she will become Johnny's girlfriend and his favorite, if you will, for the rest of his life. Polly Hamilton's boss of this bordello is, oopsie, click. This woman here, her name is Anna Sage. Anna Sage is an illegal immigrant from, uh, I believe it's Romania, she's from, and she owns this bordello, and she and Polly Hamilton share a flat in Lincoln Park. They actually share a flat just north on Halstead at the junction, just north of the junction of Halstead, Fullerton, and Lincoln Avenue. The building is no longer there, but it's in a really, really happening area. If you've been there now, it's still a lot of fun. A lot of the original buildings are still there. And so Johnny crashes whenever he's not robbing a bank out of town or um, mm, entertaining another lady someplace else. He hangs out with them. And so this is Martin Zarkovich. Martin Zarkovich was the chief of police in East Chicago, Indiana. Martin Zarkovich was one of the uh, key law enforcement officers who rushed to the scene when Dillinger made this hit that resulted, or excuse me, this the hitting of this bank that resulted in a guy passing away. Zarkovich, though he has been, um, shall we say, allowed to share the spoils of the acquaintance of a madam of a bordello, Martin Zarkovich decides he is going to come down on... Um, Anna Sage here. When Anna Sage gets the news that the Department of the Interior, excuse me, Department of Im Immigration is after her and they're going to deport her, her, she reaches out to her old buddy, Martin Zarkovich, who, though he enjoyed carnal knowledge with a number of her employees, is not so sympathetic. And he, she's asking him for help. Please help me get out of this situation. And he says, nope, can't help you. And so she plays the one card she has. So she says to Marty, Marty Zarky, listen, I don't want to be deported. I like my job. I like my business. You like my business. How about if I help you find John Dillinger? This will be a big old feather in your hat. If I help you find John Dillinger, will you maybe get the Department of Immigration off my case? Zarkovich says, I'll see what I can do. Zarkovich reaches out to Never Nervous Purvis, and Never Nervous Purvis slips and falls in his own drool because he's been looking for a tip for so long because he's got Hoover on his backside, and that is not a good thing because he's going to lose his job. No matter how beautiful his clothes are, he's going to lose his situation. So Never Nervous Purvis says, yeah, let me arrange a meeting. And she says, yeah, I can hook you up with Dillinger, but I would like um, immunity from uh, deportation. Never Nervous Purvis doesn't guarantee anything to her, but she goes ahead and provides the information as far as the capture of John Dillinger. Now, our, the stage is set. The summer of 1934 is one of, had been one of the hottest summers to date in Chicago. T for, there's a two-week period there where the temperature was averaging close to 100 degrees. And back in these days, very, very few public buildings had air conditioning. Air conditioning was relatively new in the American experience. Generally speaking, the only buildings that you could count on to have air conditioning were movie theaters and morgues. Mm, foreshadowing intended. And so John Dillinger, anyway, 
they went out to the pictures every night. You can't bet, rob banks at night and the bars don't open till later. So every night of the week and sometimes twice on Sunday, he and Polly Hamilton and Anna Sage would go out to the pictures. And so they were looking for a movie to go to on this particular night of July 24th. And this, and, and so as soon as Anna Sage got the word, she was going to set Dillinger up. Um, absolutely. There were two movies that they were considering, or two of their favorite movie theaters. One was on the near, not the near west side of Chicago, but not the far west side of Chicago, the Marlboro Theater, a grand old music palace, as you can plainly see. Well, there was a Shirley Temple picture going on there, and that really wasn't to Johnny's taste. However, a much shorter commute right around the corner from where they lived, right through the alley from where they lived, the Biograph Theater not only had a wonderfully effective air conditioning uh, system going on, but there was a movie playing there, Manhattan Melodrama, which was about bank robbers and this, that, shooting them up and everything. And John Dillinger, like most Americans, loved him some Clark Gable. In fact, Johnny, you know, self-consciously said that uh, he thought that he resembled uh, Clark Gable, and they were about the same age. I think Johnny was just a few years younger than the king, as he was known. So this is the, going to be the movie where they are going to go that night. And so Anna Sage gets on the phone and says, hey, we're going to the Biograph tonight. We're going to come out of the theater. It's going to be me, Polly Hamilton, and John. John Dillinger will be the only man in our group. I'm going, he's obvious, I'm going to be wearing an orange hat and an orange dress an orange hat and an orange dress. And, of and, and this is how you're going to be able to identify me. And the man I'm with will be Dillinger. Take him, please don't kill me. Please, baby, please don't kill me. And of course, in the moonlight and in the streetlight, the orange hat and orange dress look red. Red is a funny, fun, the, the uh, colors in the orange and red family there's something magical about them when moonlight hits them a, a, a certain kind of way. And so they come out of the theater about 1030, Dillinger's with the two ladies. Melvin, never nervous, Purvis, sees Anna Sage in the orange dress and the uh, orange hat. He lights his cigar. He tries to light his cigar, but he is so nervous. Never nervous, Purvis is indeed nervous. He has trouble lighting his cigar, but the other G-men around see him trying to light his cigar. They close. The official report is they identify themselves and Dillinger pulls a gun and then they shoot him in return. The eyewitnesses say that Dillinger never got his gun out. He started to run and one shot hit Dillinger in the eye as he was racing down the alley away from, uh, that's a couple of doors southeast from the Biograph Theater along Lincoln there. And that is where John Dillinger fell. He might have been dead before he hit the ground. All kinds of commotion and everything is going on and nobody knows what is going on except the authorities. They send the meat wagon, um, an ambulance and so forth, and they speed Johnny to the nearest hospital, which is the Alexian Brothers Hospital, but he is dead on arrival. So, as word virally goes all over the place, all over the country and all over the city that John Dillinger has indeed been killed, John's, John Dillinger's body is taken to the Cook County morgue. That building is still there. If you know the Rush Presbyterian campus, the, the oldest building at the junction of Wood and Polk. So that is just a block west of the Blue Line Station, the Polk Street Blue Line Station, those of you who know the L, that is the building where the Chicago, where the Cook County morgue was, and that is where John Dillinger's body lay for the postmortem. And but then, of course, this is a celebrity, and so uh, this is too ghoulish for me to even imagine that somebody, anybody, no matter how notorious or infamous they were, their remains would be a lot would be paraded up before they were even embalmed or anything like that, just laying under a sheet in front of a glass in the identification area so people could go up and um, ghoulishly pose for a picture with him. Nevertheless, John Dillinger was dead at the ripe old age of 31 years old. His body, of course, was shipped, once it was prepared for burial, shipped from Chicago back to the Hammond, Indiana 
area where he was interred very unceremoniously in a very unceremonious, with a very unceremonious headstone, as you can plainly see. John H. Dillinger Jr., 1903 to 19 and 34. And my friends, the question is still, why do we care? Why is it fascinating? I didn't care anything about John Dillinger when I was a little boy growing up on the South Side. But then I saw that movie with with uh, Warren Oates and I thought, wow, this guy is like some kind of Robin Hood or something like that. Maybe is it the meticulous way he was the, the one of the first people in American history to bring this meticulous lamb method to robbing banks and almost every successful bank robber does today. Was it this? Was it that Robin Hood of the 1930s and that Robin Hood of the Great Depression era that captivated people and people were going to the movies and seeing him on newsreels and so forth? Was it that his playground was the grandest city of them all at the time and the center of the universe to me to this day, Chicago, USA, at its absolute peak period celebrating its centennial? Or was it that he was just one of those cats like Jimi Hendrix, like Janis Joplin, like Hank Williams, like Otis Redding, like a number of Jack Kennedy, who's not around for very long and they're like a comet streaking across the sky and then they're gone. And whatever wasn't there as part of their actual story, we embellish and turn into the myth and turn into the legend. And the stories get juicier and juicier and juicier. And as long as they continue to sell books and get movies greenlit and so forth, who knows? Was it the man himself with all of that charisma? We may never know. But We'll still keep going and looking at this guy and trying to learn about him as long as that question is still there. Why? If you enjoyed this, my friends, or if you would like to avoid me in the future, my Facebook page is facebook.com slash music and Chicago stuff. My website is clarencegoodman.wix.com slash Clarence Goodman. Like my Facebook page and you'll get all kinds of information as far as my next appearances and so forth. I got a bunch coming up for the next um, six weeks. January has been busy. February is going to be even more hectic. But this, this is the business we've chosen. I'd like to say also that my book is out if you want to message me one way or the other can tell you how to get a copy of my book, Nerd Avenue, Chicago in Stages and from the Stage. Shout of thanks to uh, Leighton out there and everybody else with the uh, Stickney Forest View Public Library and my buddy Ivan, 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 Ivan for booking this in the first place. My friends, all of you out there, may your God go with you. Please take care of yourselves and continue to enjoy presumably robust health and prosperity. And until our paths cross again, Keep on rocking your public library. Back to you, Layton. Thank you very much, Clarence. That was fantastic. Uh, we definitely Thank appreciate you. you coming here. Did you have time for a couple questions at all? Or Sure. Project Runway isn't on for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone tuned in in Zoom has a question, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you could ask uh, in person. Or if you aren't able to do that and you want to type it in the chat room, that'll work as well. Um, if you are tuned in on Facebook, we've had about four people watching on Facebook. If you want to type a comment, I'm trying to keep an eye on that, and I could give you, I could read your question to Clarence myself as well. Um, while we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions, I will say if you've tuned into this and want to send uh, an evaluation of it to us here at the library, you can send an email to reference at sfvpld.org, or if you want to stop in and just ask for an event survey form the next time you're in, that would work as well. Um, did anyone uh, tuned in on Zoom or in Facebook have any questions for Clarence? I don't see anything in the chat room and I don't see anything on Facebook yet. Um, so I think we might be good. I'll go ahead and uh, do a quick uh, 10 count. Uh, last call for, for questions for Mr. Goodman. Nope. Okay. Well, that was exciting. I know I've uh, I've got a few movies I'm adding to my uh, my to watch list. Um, 
not not only the Warren Oates Dillinger movie, which I really definitely want to see, but I, I'm a big uh, Myrna Loy and uh, uh, the, the Thin Man movie series, and I didn't know about that Manhattan melodrama, so I want to see that one now, too. Yeah, I love the old Thin Man pictures, too. Yeah, William Powell was uh, a riot, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, and I was surprised at how well they hold up, like, you know, so many, so many years later. So, well, yeah, thank you again for all your time. time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was just about to thank you again, but then uh, you, you had one more thing to say. Oh, I was going to say, uh, William Powell was uh, a riot. I, I love when one of his pictures is coming on uh, Turner Classic or something like that. Definitely, yeah, very definitely. cool dude. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you again, Clarence. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation, and uh, we hope that those of you that tuned in uh, on Zoom or Facebook enjoyed it as well. And we'll definitely be trying to uh, to get uh, Clarence back to, to do some more speaking events in the future. Um, if you have any recommendations for topics or anything, feel free to reach out to the library as well. Thank you again, Clarence. Any final thoughts? No, just good night and God bless everybody. Thanks for coming along this evening. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. If you enjoyed this video, please like the video and subscribe to the Stickney Force View Public Library's YouTube channel. Also, like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Stickney Forest View Public Library District, where great things happen.